Welcome back to the Service Design Podcast. I'm David Morgan. And I am Stina van Hof. And today we are recording a special episode on Service Design Day. That's right, because today is the 1st of June, and that means for the second year in a row, it's Service Design Day. On Service Design Day, we try to connect service designers from all over the world and promote the field of service design. And who did we speak to for this episode? Well, in this episode, we actually spoke to different uh, service designers from all over the world. We spoke to Archer Ye from Taiwan. We also spoke to Marina Terterian from LA and to a Nigerian service designer, Charles Ikem. I found it very interesting to speak to these uh, people. It gets very interesting when you start comparing you know, the differences between different cultures, the, the way service design is done or what's important in service design. Anything particular stand out to you? Yeah, what I found really interesting is that all of them started talking about uh, organizational change and also what differences that brings along uh, in different cultures. Like in some cul cultures, companies are organized in a totally different way. So I find that actually really, uh, really interesting to hear. Mm, definitely. And... Also, it's yeah funny to see that a lot of the, the challenges are the same, even though things are different. Everybody has to deal with getting to people to understand what service design is and trying to move from a more yeah visual design-based uh, view of design to, to really understanding service design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And what also... What I also found interesting is that in the different parts of the world, uh, there's also a big difference in education. Like some countries, there's already uh, courses on service design, whereas in others, people are still looking how to incorporate it into different uh, studies, uh, like more uh, UX uh, studies where people will get service design courses. So I also found that uh, interesting to hear from them how service design is organized in uh, education. Mm. I was amazed to hear that in Taiwan there's been a service design course since, what was it, 2008? Mm -hmm. That's been around there for a really long time. Um, how would you compare that to our situation here in Belgium? Well, I'm still kind of waiting in Belgium or not really passively waiting, of course. We would love to be part of that. <laughs> uh, but that there's an actual service design course. Now we mainly have like um, more technical product development or the more um, digital product development uh, schools. But there's still, uh, I think, a big need for service design education in Belgium. Yeah, that's right. At the moment, I think the closest we can go is uh, Scandinavian countries. There seem to be several courses over there. Mm -hmm. And in Germany, from what uh, I've heard in the past. So uh, definitely uh, an opportunity there. Yes, and also a challenge because what we now see here um, is we, of course, always are looking for good service designers. Um, but the language is a really big part of being a service designer. So the, um, it's important for us that they speak Dutch. So I cannot wait before uh, there are some more uh, classes on service design in Belgium as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who, who would make really good service designers around here. Mm -hmm. And they just don't know what service design is yet and don't realize they could be a service designer. Yeah, exactly. So that's another role of a service design day, getting the awareness of service design out there. And uh, we hope to play a, a little part with this episode of the Service Design Podcast. Enjoy the episode. Bye. Hi, Arthur. Welcome to uh, our show. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Hi. So uh, this is a special episode in which we'll be uh, uh, talking to a couple of people around the world um, for Service Design Day. And we're trying to get a picture of uh, yeah, how is service design uh, living around the world. Um, but before we get started, perhaps uh, could you please introduce yourself for our listeners, Arthur? 
Yeah, thank you. Sure. So uh, my name is Arthur Ye, and I'm based in Taiwan. And I'm also the Civil Design Network Taiwan Chapter's co-founder and the representative. And currently, I'm the, uh, the lecturer in the university, in Qing, National Tsinghua University, and I'm teaching Civil Design for the uh, master program. And that's that's all about me. And um, the one addition that's the special interest in, in my point of view is facilitation. So I'm the a uh, professional certificate uh, facilitator. So I'm mainly to see how to put the facilitation skill and the service design together. Okay, interesting. And you said you were a teacher at the uh, university. Does it mean there is like a service design uh, school in, um, okay. in the, Taiwan? Or? It's not the civil design school is the uh, we our our institute is called Institute of Service Science, so it's a bigger picture. So that says the idea says okay, service science not just include design, but also service engineering, service management, this kind of things together we call service science. And then the service design courses will uh, host in the Institute of Service Science. Wow, that uh, sounds very expensive. Uh, and uh, how how long has that been around? Uh, the the institute are uh, starting on two thousand eight, and uh, so we have the service design process about two, starting like two thousand nine till now. But the teacher is just changing. I'm just take over this year. So just starting from my side, and yeah, so we have this progress about like eight years already in our institute. Wow, that's a really long time. I think uh, there's still many places where there are no service design courses uh, at all. Uh, I think Belgium, uh, <laughs> where we're from, is one of those places. Um so there is also students who've who've graduated from from your course. Um, do, do you have any idea what they are doing at the moment? Oh yeah, uh, in our institute, uh, because we our students are from the university, they graduate from the university undergraduate. Their major is has a lot of variety. So it's actually this is an interdisciplinary uh, program for the master students. So for example, this year in my classes, we have 13 students this year. And uh, the students have the background from the management, from the uh, information system, um, from design for sure. And then have the uh, student from the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what that is, but it's like the mechanical engineer or something there. Background mm -hmm. is this. And our students, I, what I know, they graduate there if they are working for related uh, job in Taiwan for service design. Mainly they are doing design research, your know, user experience design, those kind of things in different company or consulting firm. Okay, that's interesting. And do you have any idea on what kind of projects they're working? Is there a certain industry that is more popular in Taiwan for for, for service design? Uh, right now, we, Taiwan has because if you know that the the world design capital last year is in Taiwan, so that make a really interesting mixture about their focus on the world design capital last year is in social design. So what I have to say is in the past few years in Taiwan, there is a lot of um, interesting in social design. Or I will say using a design method to tour a social issue. So for our student or what our community here to doing the service design are also trying to using service design apply to the social issue or social or they, even they have social enterprise here to using service design. So that's that's the most of use of service design recently in Taiwan or most interesting in Taiwan 
right now. Um, about the private company, uh, we know they do have some interesting on that. Um, starting from, I will say, starting from design thinking uh, many years ago, and then there is a movement from uh, design thinking to a little bit server design because if you know that uh, Taiwan have a good reputation on the high tech manufacturing, so that means we have. Most of our big company are doing the high tech manufacturing or manufacturing. So most of the um, employee is an engineer. So when they have to shifting from their existing um, um, know how or practice to more service oriented practice, that is a big gap or have I would say big jump for them. So we still try hard to push that things, but uh, they need time. So I will say most of student or most of so designer in Taiwan doing a lot of social things now, and some they do the enterprise things, but in the limited, I will say the limited uh, function, like they do the education, they do some uh, a small project to try it on about what is service design or what that means for the company, why is the value for them. So they still have to negotiate the, the true value of through design for them. Okay, so the role is kind of shifting the focus on the more technical development that all those engineers are focusing on towards yes. a more uh, human-centered uh, yes. solution. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And by the way, say, the, yeah. Yeah. By the way, the, when you talk about the high tech, there is the one thing is interesting is, uh, you know, the big data is really popular right now all over the world. So for for us here, actually, a lot of company are really interesting about the big data. So this kind of data analysis is one of the, the big things also. But what we have to push in is big data is not enough. We have to talk a little bit about the small data and how we can combine the big data and the small data together and that we can leverage what their pros and cons between the list big or small data. So that is the one thing I think well unique here because we have a lot of engineers. When you talk about the data, big data or the data analysis, for them it's more like engineering. Uh, language and their practice can easy to adopt those kind of things. But a server design, when you talk about design, is a little bit uh, long distance for them. So that is the, another angle right now for us to talk about how we can, okay, you, you are interested on the big data and do you know that a small data can make more in more power or more use for your big data or how you can interpret it your big data. Do you find that these um, large companies are are becoming more and more inclined to to uh, think in uh, in design thinking, think in service design? Yes, the, a, a lot of big uh, big company uh, here are interesting on um, um, even design thinking or service design than before. Um, so what I'm saying is they they trying to um, um, evaluate what is the true value for them and what that can really help them. So most of the cases right now I can see is uh, they have a lot of like internal education. So they were hiring the, the uh, civil design practitioner to host the workshop. So there is a bunch of the workshop out there you can attend, you can try to learn. And, but uh, what they really do, that is another key thing here for us have to conquer is about the service design cases locally here, uh, the company not my like to share. They are, they are practiced as a high-tech company or high-tech manufacturing company they are likely to protect any things they do. So they are not willing to share a lot of what they are really do, but they will tell you we do, but we don't know, we don't tell you what that is, but they will share uh, what they do in the 
uh, in the social design part of war. For example, uh, one of my co-founder of SDN Taiwan is the BenQ, is uh, also the 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 a brand for manufacturing of projector, computer, uh, TV screen, and they do do the service design in the past of few years. And one thing they they do and do share on the website in the SDN Taiwan's website is their cases doing healthcare. So you can imagine that the, the BenQ is a high tech manufacturing high tech brand. They they produce the product, the the three C product, but they are sharing the cases about how they do the healthcare things in in the social context. So that is another things right now in here is they are willing to share more share about how they do for the social goods, but for the business they keep it secret. Yeah, I can imagine that's quite hard if you're trying to build a service design chapter in Taiwan and bring together uh, people who are uh, working in this field and uh, share as much no knowledge as possible to uh, make sure you all um, can learn from each other. Is that something which you notice then in the in building a chapter? Yes, that's that's the main purpose for me to build up the chapter. Because what I learned, actually, what I learned from the SDN in the Europe um, or the Europe chapter is uh, they have a lot of chance to learn from each other. They're willing to share and share how they work and how the cases and what they make the impact for. And we, we don't have too much this kind of culture here. So what I, I, my ambition is to build up the chapter is we can encourage this chapter as a platform so the um, people can share their knowledge and also share their, uh, maybe their, their opportunity to each other. So we can build up through design here, I will say here in Asia, because the, the, I will say service have a highly correlation with the culture. So the one service that might work in Europe might work in America, but not work in Asia. So the same idea is that the, when you do the service design, there is a total different things. I, I hear the one, one interesting quote from my friends to talk about how they do the user research in India. And normally we do the, the user research and, or we have the interviewee. So we will make appointment with the interviewee says, okay, maybe the Wednesday, three o'clock to maybe four o'clock, like one hour's interview. But in India, you make appointment is, okay, it's Wednesday afternoon. That's it. That is how they make the, 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 the appointment. So, Mm -hmm. What that really means about a Wednesday afternoon is, okay, you come in in the Wednesday afternoon and then we can have a tea first and have a chatting first and then we will see how it's going and how we can start. So that means you you make appointment for the whole afternoon to the one interview. So this wow. reflecting a lot of the cultural difference between a country to country around Asia. In Taiwan, we also have our unique things. In Japan, they definitely have their unique things there. And how we can, and that is, I think, the most uh, valuable things is we can learn from each other and we can inspire by each other about a different culture and how we can work together or learn together. That is the chapter. I think the chapter or even the chapter as a platform to connect to the other chapter around Asia, that is the key things, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said you were also a specialist in facilitation. I'm also wondering if there are any uh, special cultural differences in Taiwan when working with a, a large group of people and uh, ideating together. 
do you think there is a big difference in how uh, people are expressing themselves in Taiwan from other parts of the world? I think I'm I'm not quite sure is so different, but uh, what I can I can experience is when we do in for example like if you're doing ideation in Taiwan, we all know that who do you do the brainstorming and there is the bunch of the ground rules to tell you how to do the brainstorming like defer judgment and and do as many as well and so there is some criteria to tell you okay how you can have a good uh group brainstorming together and but the true story here in taiwan i will say i'm not i will not say always but most of the time it's hard to in, uh apply this kind of the ground rule that you used to use in the the west world Because when you say defer judgment, so that means you don't, on that time, you don't defer judge, you, you don't have a judgment from each idea by saying out. And when you put down this ground rule in our situation, yes, the people will be really serious to not saying anything or saying any judgmental words, but they will think about that. So, so the interesting thing is you can doing the brainstorming, and then there is a bunch of the people here. They actually they are judged inside their heart, but not saying, and not mm -hmm. not helping about the group brainstorming. So, in terms about this situation, sometimes I will I will see the how how the team work together. But there is a one technique that we will apply is we don't do starting from the group brainstorming in the beginning. We are doing the personal brainstorming in the beginning. So that means you're brainstorming yourself first, but not putting out any things before the end of the session. So that means you might have the, your personal brainstorming by yourself And so you can brainstorming like 20 or 30 ideas. And then following that might have the two choices. The one choices will be uh, you are paired by your partner. So like it's a two people together, you can discuss or sharing about what your brainstorming is and have a discussion about your ideas. And then back to the big group, then pop up your consensus of two people's ideas. This kind of the process transform is uh, we we don't put down the ideas in the few words and the other will have a lot of kind of judgmental inside their heart on that time. But they have a more time to have a conversation about what your really idea is, but we still keep This kind of brainstorming session about the, the peer is so. This kind of discussion, you still have kind of the people to uh, put it together, and then you still have brainstorming. Maybe it's just in the small, smaller size of the group, and then bring back to the big group. So, but that depends on what kind of the the group. If this is the group are really used to do the group brainstorming, then we can just do the group brainstorming. But most of the time in here, if you work with the engineer or other not really familiar with this kind of big group brainstorming, and then we will apply the other technique to facilitate a real conversation and real brainstorming together on that. Wow. Yeah, it's always very interesting to hear these cultural differences uh, between uh, countries and how you do uh, workshops, what works in with facilitation. Uh, Stina, you've done workshops in, in the Netherlands and Belgium, two tiny countries next to each other. But do you see any difference already between those two countries? Yeah, definitely. I, I studied in, in the Netherlands and uh, I'm now working in Belgium. And I experience already a huge difference, even though... We are like uh, so close to each other, and we're um, we're speaking the same language. And in Holland, people are so much more outgoing, and they really want to share their ideas in a in a large group. They don't have any problems with that. And whereas in Belgium, people are a lot more 
uh, held back, I think. Um, they're afraid to say something that is not right. Um, and they don't have that, uh, need to express themselves, um, in, in a big group. I think it's, uh, also even in those two countries, we already need like different, uh, brainstorm techniques to make sure everyone is, uh, contributing to a workshop. So it's really interesting to hear how it's, uh, already on the other side of the of the world <laughs> yeah that's that's interesting to hear about the Netherlands and the Belgium actually we will have the one chance this year in my classes is to have a cross-country collaboration we will have joint workshop with Japan the other uh, is called the Institute of Chiba Tech in the June so our students will work together and have a workshop and a simple idea actually is to put our student to end their student to work with the different culture of a student to together for have a workshop. And we will have a reflection after that to see how you can facilitate the participant from the different culture. So we want to strain this kind of ability of our student to see, okay, that's the di totally different uh, cultural thinking logic and how you can handle that. So we can push a little bit forward for our student to say, okay, you should have a build up the ability to work around Asia, not just in Taiwan. Uh, that's really, really cool. Um, the, the Institute, uh, does that attract international students or are there only students from Taiwan there? Uh, in our institute, we have the foreign student for the PhD program, but not the master program. We have some, sometimes we will have some from China, but, uh, um, yeah, mainly we, because our courses offer in the master classes is in, in Mandarin, mainly in Mandarin. But there still have some of the foreign students, like we have the GMBA, it's the global MBA. So that means we are hiring the, uh, we are recruiting the student from all over the world. And also our PhD is also the international PhD. So we have a lot of PhD students from all over the world. So that is the case. But in this time, in my class in the service design, only from the student from Taiwan. Okay. Great. Um, well, I think it was really interesting to hear about your experiences uh, with service design in, in Taiwan and uh, the cultural differences that brings along with it. I think you know, there's a lot we can still learn from each other. Uh, if, if people want to find out more about you or about uh, the Institute, uh, where can they find this online? Uh, they can just simply search the Institute of Service Science uh, in the National Tsinghua University. So you can just type NTHU and the Institute of Service Science. That is our institute. And for, for me, that you can just uh, search me on the LinkedIn is author year. So you can easily to, to connect me. Yeah. Okay. We will uh, add these links to, uh, to our show notes uh, also. Um, do you have anything uh, you'd like to say to uh, the global listeners on this uh, service design day? Uh, I think the the I will I will warmly welcome that the the service design practitioner over the world to if they are interesting to come in the Asia because the Asia that we we right now is the situation is uh, every, I I talk to a lot of country around Asia they are really interesting about service design right now uh, Japan uh, South Korea. Hong Kong, Singapore, China, Thailand, they all have the interesting and they all have the different progress. Right now, the difficulty is uh, enough talent here. So that means we still have, like in my class, we still want to put loose, put, push loose students to become the future talent, but we still lack of a lot of talents here in Asia for service design. So I think that is an opportunity. And also the next big things from here in Asia, I, I will say is uh, I'm trying to push hard that how we can really connect the different country around Asia about service design. That, that is really difficult to compare with the Europe because you can have a bike 
to the other country, but we have to take a flight. So that is a big diff- difficulty for us, but that is the big things that I'm trying to push in. And that's a lot of things happening here around Asia about server design are really exciting and full of the potential and that we can uh, build our own server design uh, logic here in Asia by maybe coming five years, I will say. Yeah. So do you think for service designers in, in, in Europe or in, in the States, for instance, that there's opportunities in, in Asia for them to come over? I think definitely they have a lot of opportunity. But uh, one thing is actually is not just the, the challenge from the people from America or Europe, but the also from for us, the people here is the language. So like, for for example, that my student will work with the Japan student. Actually, the language is a big bad barrier. So I will say there is a lot of opportunity, but language might be the first challenge for everyone want to come in. I know there is the one sub designer from Denmark, uh, uh, working in Japan right now. They just be hiring this year. So that is a big. Uh, big exciting for us says okay there is some people from Europe and working in Asia now and they can he can bring the different uh, perspectives or different culture background into the Asia's culture and um, but you know he can speak Japanese so that's why he can be hiring in in Japan so I will say there is full of potential. An opportunity, but the language is one of the big things we have to figure out how we can work together or how we can conquer this barrier. Yeah, that's true. I, I agree. Uh, language is one of the most important tools we have as a service designer. So yes. uh, <laughs> you need to have that in your in your case. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Arthur. Thank uh, you. As I, you said, we'll add the links uh, where to find information to the show notes. And uh, will we be seeing you at the next uh, conference? Yes, the definitely. Service Design Global Conference. Okay, that's great. Then everybody can, uh, can come and reach out to you over there. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, Marina, nice to uh, have you here in uh, in this special episode for the Service Design Day. Uh, how are you doing? Hi, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? Yeah, really good. Yeah, great. Thanks. <laughs> so I'm sure uh, most of our listeners uh, know who you are as you uh, have your own podcast, uh, Why Service Design. Um, but uh, for those who don't know you, could you please introduce yourself? Absolutely. My name is Marina Tertarian. I am a service designer and design thinking advocate in Los Angeles. Um, I run a service design agency called the Y Lab um, and recently started a new project called the Good Projects, which is service design for social innovation and civic innovation. Um, for social enterprises and civic innovation, sorry. Um, and I also run the Service Design Thinking uh, podcast, which is uh, Why Service Design Thinking podcast, which is how we met. You guys are the Service Design Thinking. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, we we met each other at uh, the the Service Design Conference last year. <laughs> So that was good. Um, so in this uh, episode uh, uh, for Service Design Day, we're trying to take a look at at how service design is is embedded in in different places around the around the world. So looking at your location in in Los Angeles, um, uh, what can you say about service design? Is it something that's very common, commonly practiced already around there? You know what, service design in Los Angeles is very exciting right now. Um, It's certainly a growing community and it's a growing practice. It's not as super active as it is in other parts of the world. And I always notice that whenever I'm, you know, anywhere else, um, anytime I'm in Europe and I see how easily and quickly service design is adopted, um, or even I I was in New York City a couple weeks ago um, and I saw it being adopted in in various parts of government and various businesses. So LA is definitely on the road to becoming that, which is very, very exciting. I love being at the 
you know, beginning of things. Um, there are a few big agencies out here that practice and promote service design. Um, and there's a, a handful of little agencies that are kind of growing um, in, in getting the practice more for businesses of different sizes. So I would say that it's it has a lot of potential in LA, which is something that I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing how it grows. Mm -hmm. And are you in contact with those other uh, service design agencies? Do you share uh, knowledge or ideas with each other? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of opportunities to come together. Um, one of the big ones is, you know, the Global Service Jam um, that is now amazing. And, uh, you know, it's practice, I think, what is it, 100 cities about a hundred cities every year, um, through events like that. And through those kinds of big community gatherings, um, we try to join forces where we can. I do a lot of events in Los Angeles and I actually teach a lot in Los Angeles. So any opportunity there is to pull from, you know, the LA service design community and bring people together to show that it's not just one person talking about service design or one business practicing it, that there really is a community and it, we're kind of in the process of mobilizing them and, and trying to get everyone together as often as we can. Um, there's a service design meetup that uh, a friend and I are part of that, uh, where we try to organize events and panel discussions. Um, in fact, just later today, I'm chatting with someone about a uh, possibly doing something else with the LA community. So I think there's a, there's a little bit happening and there's going to be a lot happening very soon. Okay, nice. And is the uh, industry also involved? Like clients, are they also joining those events? Or is it mainly uh, the people who pra practice, practice, protection, wait, sorry, mm -hmm. practition <laughs> service design? You know, I do have to say, I think the bigger part of the service design community is designers. Um, but I'm definitely seeing a lot of crossover. Um, I would like to see very soon the big part of, you know, not just designers or not just other people in other parts of design, like UX design or even product management um, being involved in the community. I definitely like to see a world where it's small business owners and marketers and programmers and biologists um, being involved. I, I think right now I see a lot of designers, um, but I think that is definitely on the uptick and definitely looking towards getting more and more people in other industries involved, because that's the whole point, right? The more people we can get across different industries, um, the better, the, the more we can advocate for service design. Mm -hmm. And and how is it with uh, education? Are there any special courses or institutes for you know, service design in the states? Um, there are a few in the states, not a ton in LA. Um, I know there's a few great programs um, in the U.S. There's one that actually I'm part of. I'm getting an executive master's degree at the new school, Parsons School of Design, um, which has a design management program and service design is a really huge part of that. Um, so that's been really cool where that, you know, the, the new school is a U.S. based school, but it's very international. And this program itself is very international. So we're getting a service design and a design thinking look, but we're getting it in this global perspective, which is really cool. Um, I know that Savannah College of Design um, has a really great service design program. Of course, in California, um, Stanford uh, is not too far from us, but um, they are primarily focused on design thinking. Um, so there's, I think there's a lot of great resources for education. Um, I see, you know, individual classes pop up here and there. I'm actually in the process of creating some service design programs in LA that, you know, not obviously not a master's level by any means, but um, community programs that people can come and be part of and get a taste of service design and, you know, learn it over the course of a few days. So um, there's, I think I would definitely love to see more of that coming up, especially in LA. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, we were speaking uh, with uh, Arthur Yee um, in, in, earlier in this episode. Um, he was uh, a service designer in, in Taiwan and uh, 
he's uh, works at a, in an institute that's been around doing service design since 2008. So that's oh, wow. a really long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things uh, that came up was also uh, cultural differences in service design, how different countries may have different challenges in, in mm -hmm. service design. Mm, mm -hmm. Do you think in, in, in LA or in the States, there's some, some, yeah, things that are a particular challenge in service design or getting it adopted or practicing service design? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, now I can't wait to hear your, your interview with Arthur and see what he said about his part of the world. Um, you know, I think from my perspective, the biggest challenge I've seen is making a business case for service design. I think that some of the human centered principles are easily adopted. And actually, I think that social media has kind of paved the way for some of that customer interaction, right? Some or the constituents interaction where it's okay to have a two way communication. It's okay to better understand people. Um, I think marketing in some ways has even paved the way for a little more customer empathy and, you know, getting customer, doing customer personas and at least thinking through some of the journey, of course, nowhere near the great depth that service design dives into, but I definitely see some glimpses where bits of service design are, are accepted in other parts of business, but I am definitely noticing that there's a little more ways to go when it comes to getting service design as a line item at, you know, in a budget or really making it a no brainer expense that this is something that really has to happen for the, for the betterment of the business or people using service design as a go-to for solving a problem. Like anything we come across, the first thing you think about is service design. Um, that's, that's a world I would love to live in. Um, but I definitely see that as a little bit of a barrier to entry where there's still a lot of educating to do, which is, which is why I'm always, uh, quick to point out that what I consider as part of my job is, um, as design thinking advocate, that that's kind of a real, very real and a very tangible part of, I think, uh, honestly, I think all of our jobs, I, I think our, all of us service designers, I see us doing it. It's really cool and exciting that we'll do design, but we save a, a really special part of our lives and our day and our energy to advocate for it. Um, and I think that's what will help bridge the gap a little bit. So I know that maybe in other parts of the world, it's a no brainer to adopt service design at all levels, whether it's a big corporate level or a uh, civic engagement, or um, even on a small business level. Um, here, I definitely see that there's an education process that has to happen as you prep the community for the need for service design. And once it's there, right, once everybody knows about it, then it's, it's really easy for them to understand the benefits. Um, but I definitely think there's that extra step. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We are from, from Europe, from Belgium, actually. And um, if we think about America, we always think about a very commercial industry, like bigger things and cheaper things. And maybe it's not true, like, uh, but it's something how uh, I think a lot of Europeans see uh, America. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you can counter this, but that's what I, I was wondering. I could imagine that in uh, uh, this kind of more commercial um, uh, culture, that it might be more difficult to uh, a focus on, on users and what can be, um, what we can bring as a company towards users. Do you think that's something, uh, is it right what we're thinking or, uh, not really? <laughs> um, yes and no. I would, I would definitely say, I mean, every time I'm in Europe, um, and I've, I've been coming and going a lot this last year because of this uh, global, degree from persons. And, um, I see a very tangible difference. Um, you know, it's, I loved meeting everybody at the service design conference and seeing how many agencies there were, you know, because that shows me that there's a lot of demand. Um, and you know, everybody had cool projects that they were working on. Um, so there is a little bit of a difference. I do think that one of the things that you, the U.S. business sector thrives in is um, customer service, 
which means that, you know, it's it's definitely been seeing a big uh, emphasis in recent years. And I think that that is promising. That tells me that, right, we're moving away from the commercial cut and dry. Um, you see a lot of smaller businesses adopting really important customer service to things, or you see you see larger businesses adopting some of these really important principles like inside out principles like uh employee happiness right there's that there's that company um that created a minimum payment for all their employees um gravity payments or zappos they have a really big employment culture so i i think that it's changing from that so hopefully the perception will keep up accordingly um there's been some <laughs> pieces of it <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, and I think it may be in certain parts of government. I, I always look to Europe as also a really good example of a lot of the civic innovation that happens. Um, and I see that changing here too. Like, for example, um, I met Ariel Kennan, who's, um, a Parsons alum and she runs service design over at the mayor's office in New York city. And they are doing amazing things with service design and for, for a city like New York, right. To be adopting, design principles and being able to create change on this massive scale. Um, they helped New York city get free Wi-Fi all over the city and they used the design process to make it happen. And they helped, uh, the, some of their homeless serving agencies, um, do, do good, you know, um, better fine tune themselves so that they can better serve the homeless population all through design. So I give uh, all these examples <laughs> to say that it's definitely, I think it may be a little bit different than the perception. I definitely, I can understand why there is that perception. Um, but I do say, I think there's, there's a lot that we could learn from, from how things are done around the world. Um, and I think, you know, of course I can't be adopted fast enough, right? So service design for everybody all the time, starting right now. Um, but it, it's on the way, it's on the way. <laughs> <laughs> and and to be fair, of course, uh, the, the big examples that everybody always uh, refers to, uh, for instance, uh, Airbnb or Uber, they, of course, uh, originate from the States. So, yeah. uh, so, <laughs> no doubt about, uh, about yeah. design innovation there. Um, <laughs> you were talking about service design uh, being a no-brainer. I don't think uh, in in our case in Belgium it's definitely not a no brainer yet, but uh, we find in, in 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 public services it's heading a bit more in that way. Some departments in government for them it is becoming a no brainer to apply service design. Uh, the bigger difference is in 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 the, the private sector. There it's still a lot of convincing that needs to be done. How mm -hmm. is it oh, in, in the public sector in uh, in in LA is uh, Is service design being used by government there in any way? You know, it's beginning to. Um, just recently, I started to look at LA in a different light. I was thinking about this idea of innovation clusters. And um, I had listened to a bunch of TED Talks and I was reading up about this, the concept of innovation clusters and how certain cities are... Um, best equipped to be an innovation uh, cluster. And they have that triple helix model of a uh, large educational institution and government support and some cornerstone large corporations that champion innovation. And I was looking at that model and then looking at LA and thinking, LA is an innovation cluster because we have all of the pieces. It's growing and it's not, maybe not as obvious as some other cities like San Francisco, right? Everybody knows that's where innovation happens. Um, mm -hmm. cool. But in LA, I think that we have a lot going on. It's still new, which is why it's probably still quiet. And I think that there are maybe some big wins that are coming up on the horizon that are maybe necessary for the rest of the world to see it as an innovation cluster. But, um, but there's a lot going on. For example, uh, LA has a metro which not many people may know about, but it has an amazing metro system. Um, it's clean, it's beautiful, very efficient. Um, and there, the LA Metro team is always trying to do cool things. So one of their, their new initiatives in the recent years was that they have now a Department of Extraordinary Innovation. Um, so they're, they're trying to bring you know, some of these practices 
to the LA Metro, try to get more people riding it, try to create parts of met services for uh, for Metro Metro users and the LA community. Um, so that's really exciting. Uh, there's a, a clean tech incubator that opened up not too long ago. Um, LA has an innovation team. Um, it's called an I-team. They're a part of the Bloomberg Philanthropies Initiative to get innovation teams in various uh, cities in the U.S., um, I think spearheaded by the mayor's department. So L.A. is one of those cities. Um, so there's definitely, I see things happening. Um, I'm always super inspired when I see things like the New York City mayor's office, and I can't wait for for that to happen. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, obviously, I'm not super ingrained with all parts of it. Um, so there might be stuff happening in, behind the scenes that I'm not aware of. Um, but it's not incredibly public. Um, but I do, I definitely see it, especially keeping that, that idea of this innovation cluster in mind. I see a lot of things kind of bubbling and I would imagine that it would come to the surface in the future. That's a part of too, um, what certain things like when we do events or bring the community together, I think those are opportunities to, to see more of that. And every time we do that, we see more of like, oh, hey, this this great thing is happening in this division I didn't know about. Um, or uh, it might inspire some, you know, it might inspire a certain piece of the government to do something. Um, so I, I hope that I hope that made sense. But it's, it's definitely, I think, on the up and up. Yeah. What are type of clients you're having? What kind of industries are they are they coming from? And what type of questions are they uh, asking? Um, are we thinking for service design or yes, I'm thinking in general? The, yeah, with your, uh, with your company? Um, let's see. I serve a variety of different industries. Um, I, with my company, the Y Lab, I'm open-ended. I serve a corporate, small business, uh, every level. Um, with my company, The Good Projects, I focus a lot on social enterprise. And that's actually something that I think is really big in LA. Um, this idea of starting social enterprises, um, you know, having not just nonprofits, but that, that give back model where it's a business, but there's also some sort of social good component. Um, I, I, I serve a lot of those, those kinds of clients. And I think that that's also really big in LA. Um, and LA is because I see it as a little bit of a center for that. Um, I also serve the education industry, which is very close to my heart. And I think there's a lot of opportunities there to to embed a lot of the design principles. Um, let's see. I'm I'm actually working towards getting uh, rallying up more of the public sector community. So we have some projects that we're working on that we'll be releasing pretty soon uh, with the good projects, specifically with the civic innovation um, pieces of Los Angeles. Um, so I think I personally think service design should be adopted by everyone all the time, right across mm -hmm. across all different industries. So it's my personal mission to hit every single every single industry um, as quickly as I can. Yeah, you you sparked my Thank interest uh, with education. Um, I've just uh, rounded off a big uh, service design project for education here. What kind of mm -hmm. a project uh, was it that you were working on? Um, the one I'm working on specifically is, so I, I come from, uh, music education, um, as a background before I did service design, um, I was involved in the music education industry, uh, doing marketing and, um, other parts of business and, uh, specifically jazz, which is where my heart is always. Um, and I'm working on a, an online jazz school that teaches soft skills of music education, um, I think education in general, I really see this as a broader issue, but we focused it to music um, because there's a specific need. But music education is very one-sided. It's really focused on teaching people how to play and the technical skills. But there's this whole universe of thoughts that go on in your brain as a musician when you're learning music, when you're playing music, when you're trying to play with other people and trying to get gigs and, you know, create a career um, that's not often taught, but musicians kind of informally teach each other 
um, and they learn from each other informally and they try to under, they, they, um, you know, try to better themselves and they spend a lot of energy doing it, but there's really no formal way to do it. Um, and, uh, there's certain, certain people who are amazing at teaching it. So I was actually approached by a music teacher, um, who had written a bunch of material about this topic. Um, and I was approached just to, to see what can be done with it. And we use the design process to figure out what's the best fit, what's the best way to deliver this information. Um, we, we actually use the process to determine that this was a need um, because the curriculum was written for a different purpose. Um, but as we went through service design, we realized that actually there's, there's a huge need somewhere else. There's a specific way that people want this information delivered. Um, and to me, it was really a great, um, a great, look at the education system and where education is headed in the future with like Khan Academy and creative live and, and all of these, uh, these digital platforms, um, to see how we can combine the two. Um, so I think that, you know, that's just one piece of what design means in education. Um, but I think that there's, I I'm completely with you. I think that there's, there's so much potential. Yeah, definitely in an area that's ripe for innovation. Uh, hasn't been yes. much innovation in the last uh, hundred years. They always say about uh, education. Um, yeah. So uh, very <laughs> exciting. It's also something that's close to everybody's heart. Uh, as everybody yeah, uh, needs education and, and sees how education uh, makes a difference for, yeah, for the new generation, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... I think it's uh, been really cool to have a chance to uh, chat with uh, you fellow podcaster <laughs> yes, <laughs> and uh, to get a, a bit of an uh, insight into the service design uh, state in uh, Los Angeles. Um, if people want to uh, reach out to you or find out more about you or your podcast, where, where can they find you online? You can find me at whyservicedesignthinking.com and you can also find uh, the two major projects that I'm working on at thewhylab.com and thegoodprojects.com. And also, um, of course, I'll feel free to, to find me on LinkedIn and say hello uh, My uh, find or uh, find me on Twitter. My handle is at thewhylab. All right. Yeah, we'll add all these links to our show notes uh, as well. Um, and you, uh, are you going to be uh, at the uh, next service design conference again in Madrid? I plan to. I, I will definitely be in Europe around that time. So I'm trying to figure out uh, figure out my itinerary and um, definitely try to make it there. I, I love that conference. Isn't it amazing? Yes, uh, it's uh, the most relevant <laughs> conference uh, around. <laughs> no, uh, we're looking forward to going there ourselves as well. Uh, if you're in Europe and you're around uh, Belgium, uh, definitely let us know that we can meet up. It's <laughs> a, a tiny country, so uh, you will never be far away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I will take you up on that. I plan to come to Belgium at some point this year. Right. So, <laughs> Excellent. We'll see you then. <laughs> Thanks a lot again. Wonderful. And uh, until uh, we meet each other next time. Thank Wonderful. you. <laughs> Thank you so much for Bye. having me. Bye-bye. Hi, Charles. Uh, thank you for joining us on this uh, special episode for uh, Service Design Day. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great, Matt. I'm Stena from the Service Design Podcast team. Um, I'm very pleased to join you guys today. Thank you. Great. So uh, could you please uh, introduce yourself to our listeners? Okay. My name is Charles, and um, I am a service designer based in Lagos, Nigeria. And I've been practicing service design for about seven, eight years now. And... Um, I have an office here based in Lagos and also in Johannesburg, South Africa. And uh, this is basically what I do for a living, designing services. Okay, cool. And what kind of services are you uh, designing? Okay, um, at the moment or in the past, we have designed um, social policies with government. We have designed um, banking services, banking applications with um, banking institutions here in Nigeria. Um, We've also worked on um, billing applications with um, energy companies and utility companies. Um, basically, we are working on um, more also into with startups, ICT startups, and work on things like um, interaction with customers, uh, mobile apps, web interfaces, and stuff like that. And that is what we do, actually. 
No. So you also uh, set up a, a service design network chapter, I understand? Um, yes. Uh, around last year, 2016, um, a couple of agencies with myself leading them, we tried to set up a um, service design network, um, Lagos, um, there in Nigeria. And we, we had our first meetup around last year in March. And so we started to bring agencies working in different sectors together for us to forge a way and um, bring more awareness into service design practices. Okay. Do you think it's uh, still necessary to bring more awareness uh, in Nigeria? Are people already, already familiar with uh, service design? No, I, I think it's awareness is very, very important. Service design is still at the very early stages. And uh, most importantly, people that are practicing service design in Nigeria don't actually know they are practicing service design. Like, um, we have situations whereby um, customer service uh, departments in, uh, in banking, we are doing things like customer journey mapping, we are doing things like net promoter score, but their work also interacts with user experience and service design. So, but they don't really, they are not really forming a body of knowledge to take the practice forward. So everybody is still practicing in silos. So we think it's very good for us to be able to, to, to tell people about what service design can do and also have our case studies of our own to show um, how service design works to the people. So it's very important that we do awareness at this stage. In your agency, uh, do you run your agency alone or do you have a team? Yes, obviously we have a team um, which has different diverse backgrounds from social sciences to anthropologists to traditional people that are trained in media. Um, myself, I am a trained designer, industrial design and design management. I was trained in the UK. Um, and then we have other people that are, that are mainly people that are trained in um, interaction design or things like user experience design that are working with us at the moment. And then other people like graphic designers as well. And we work with, we are a very small team of about six people, but more especially, we also work with freelance designers along the way. Yes. And, uh, as for education, how is uh, is there any form of education for service design in Nigeria? Um, no, at the moment, no. Um, we have a very strong design and art culture, um, surprisingly, in Nigeria. But um, what it's missing is design education. And um, I think the, the problem is two-pronged. First of all, we have people have to see if when the job market is matured and developed. I think it also drives education and vice versa. So at the moment, I think that um, the, the job market or the employers are not seeing any reason and the educators are not seeing any reason to be able to develop a curriculum or to be able to invest in having a design, design, uh, design education. And uh, these are the things we are working with education partners to see how we can start training, even if it's in vocational studies and um and workshops, but not formal at this stage. But um, the only design education we have in Nigeria is is at the crossroads of industrial engineering, industrial design, graphic design, arts, but not necessarily in the more formal or temporary design education like interaction design and uh, user experience design going on in the world now. No. Mm -hmm. You said you uh, followed your uh, education in the UK? Yes, yes, yes. What do you think are the the biggest difference between service design in the UK and service design in Nigeria? Um, in terms of development and the problems, I think they are very much similar and in terms of how it is growing because um, service design in the UK grew as a result of um, citizen awareness, um, the, 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 the startup culture, um, government trying to bring in more innovation for citizens and more demanding consumers. It's still very similar. These are the issues we have, and people are looking for where innovation will come in to be able to to be able to boost innovation. So, uh, but uh, the, where the difference is is that um, the UK service design scene is very much more developed in terms of education, in terms of practitioners, in terms of the government even driving service design in different sectors like healthcare and social policies. But um, it's not like that yet. It's very early stages here in Nigeria and we are still trying to see whether the government can come in. And Is there any 
public service design being done yet? Is are any yes, government yes. projects um, being the, tackled? The, I think over the last 20, 20 to 30 years, where we have to see international aid agencies trying to move from throwing money to problems, especially in Africa as a whole, and they, they switched towards capacity building. So you have to see organizations like um, UNHCR Innovation. They are trying to come in with their methodology instead of trying to bring money to government in form of aid. So they are coming with their own methodologies, with their own training, and trying to empower government agencies. And these people, they came with methodologies such as design thinking, systems thinking, and these are being applied in government agencies. I think in about 2013, um, a social policy design organization based in New York, they actually work with the World Bank, and they set up office in Nigeria. Um, it's called Reboot. Uh, it's a well-known um, agency based in New York. And they set up agencies in Nigeria, and they are working with government in several uh, sectors, especially relating to health care, especially relating to community development and things like that. So um, these are where we are seeing development come, um, especially on the government side and social um, interventions. Um, I, think, I think there are about two agencies working on this area now in Nigeria still. But did you say it was um, agencies from other countries? Yeah, yeah. International? This is an international yeah. agency that's set up. That's set up. Yeah. It's an yeah. Okay. And do you think, are they applying like the same methods and techniques that they're doing in other countries? Or yeah. do they have like a, a program which is uh, adjusted to the Nigerian needs? Or do you think it, it, that's not necessary? Yes. Um, oh. One of these agencies we we had um, we had um, when we had our meetup last year and our first conference, um, Service Design Lagos. I think they presented some case studies on to similar to similar to similar to similar to similar to whatever is applied anywhere anywhere in the world. Um, steps of service design and design thinking. But um, I think every every country or every environment or community presents challenges, and which means you have to. Um, adapt your design methodology, your design research, how you collect data. So I think that is just the difference. But in terms of the practices, is they are the same. What they are doing is the same like every, every other place in the world. I was uh, interested in the, the different agencies that are in Nigeria who, who came to your uh, meetup. What kind of different types of agencies are there at the okay. moment? Okay, I think um, the bulk of the agencies are working mainly on the intersection of startup and ICT. And most of the their, their practices are usually in the area of user experience design and interaction design. And most of them are working with startups and banks. And um, their services are usually more or less digital. I think at the moment in our, um, in our first meetup, we, about, we have about five agencies working in this area. And this is where the bulk of the people working in this in service design are working, especially digital services interaction design, user experience design, and these are where they are mainly based. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where do you think um, the service design uh, is moving towards in Nigeria? Do you think in the future it will be more, um, uh, more other types of uh, companies will start using it? Or what do you think will change? Um, yes, I think that um, it's still very early, but in the future, I think that the future of uh, of our practice in Nigeria will be about demonstrating that design can really be a part of, uh, can be used as an organizational change tool and culture. I think it's very important that design starts from the top to be able to be just like marketing and product development is embedded in, in, in organizations. I think um, it's very important for us to, to have a seat at the top um, where we can be able to see change and be allocated budgets. So I am thinking that um, where design can really make a change again is in the area of social design and uh, in the area of policy especially in Nigeria, we have issues, we don't have issues, we don't have the basic things, we don't get the basic things right. I can go on and on. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, like uh, the government uh, is trying to promote something like a, a, a savings culture among people, you know, in this area that we are having issues about recession and uh, economic challenges. Um, but 
the banking industry, how they are approaching um, things like saving culture, like throwing money to it, sometimes working, sometimes working, sometimes working, sometimes working, sometimes it's counterproductive. So we see a situation whereby design and research comes together to be able to, 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 to apply concepts like knowledge and behavioral psychology to be able to improve how people save. And we are beginning to tell people that most of these things are very important to how we be able to attack such um, systemic challenges. I think that's really interesting because I I can imagine that there is a very big difference between um, organizations in, for example, we are from Europe um, and companies from uh, from Africa in general. Like in in our countries, the governments governmental institutions are often very big and they are existing already for a really long time and they have a lot of knowledge about certain things and. Uh, do you think that there is also a big uh, difference in that in uh, in Nigeria? Um, yes, yes. Um, our culture here, in terms of business, in terms of organizations, is um, we have these. Our we have organizations that have the mentality that you have to throw money at a problem to be able to solve the problem, and we have this mentality of um, noise making. When I mean noise making, I mean visual noise. As, 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 um, organizations believe that it. If you develop a product, you have to paste the posters all over the places. You have to go on the radio and put in so many um, spots on the time. So people are not really focusing on how the user experience is aligned rather than how the people want to sell as immediately as possible. Um, but I look at other countries whereby you have this immediacy and this time problem, which is a, a country like a city like New York or Hong Kong. But people pay attention to experiences and people pay attention to quality as well. So I see a situation where it's happening, what is happening, what is happening, what is happening, what is happening. But we have a place with how innovate, how innovate, how innovate, how innovation, state of life, 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 to post to try, ha, trying to make with as, as mm -hmm. bodies, is bodies, is bodies, is so, but in terms of action of the action of the driving to driving to driving towards organizations. It is top notch here in Nigeria, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now, more the budget is often going then to marketing at the end of uh, developing a product, yeah, and more like short term. We have to sell it now exactly, instead of exactly. thinking a long term uh, good design. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yes. So you've been uh, practicing service design for eight years, I think you said. Um, what have you seen change over that time? Okay, I think I have seen uh, the way we approach service design now, um, as opposed to when I started. Um, we are starting to, when I started service design, it was more about um, the aesthetics or how we present those orientations, orientations, on how we design interaction. But I think at the moment we are also thinking about how our design is going to embed with the business. So we are also bringing in a lot of business thinking inside what we are doing, trying to develop a methodology to measure the value and return on investment on service design. I think that is very much very important because um, most of any organization that we are approaching that haven't been able to know service design will have to see the return on investment. So it's no longer about um, deliverable such as beautiful customer journey maps or beautiful outputs. People want to see what they can actually get in return from investing in service design. So we have shifted our practice from just um, trying to produce beautiful objects or beautiful aesthetics to trying to demonstrate the return on investment. Another shift um, I am seeing is trying to move from from commercial design to mm -hmm. to, to social intervention. So design going into to solve um, serious um, systemic issues in the society like corruption, like policy. I think we are also trying to explore those avenues as well. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of that? It makes me curious how you can uh, tackle a problem like uh, corruption with service design. Um, yes, I, I, I've written a lot about, you know, I've written a lot about service design and corruption in the past here in Nigeria, trying to draw attention of the government to how we can work um, on, I, I think is is a is a little bit about a little bit more about um, trying to change 
people's perception of what corruption is and what corruption is in agencies, 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 agencies um, that you have to put in order in terms of trying to to make them to work in sync or follow a particular process of vouching. We are trying to see a government, which 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 means everything the government to a big action billboard. We are trying to be able to rig it in like food, 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 on board food, on board food, on board it on what will be used to them. So it's more like bringing service design and the normal um, process of um, transmitting techniques, safety techniques, safety techniques into what the government is doing. And we propose it like bringing designing interfaces where the people can actually meet with the government. And uh, uh, that is where what we think will happen. We haven't been able to work on this area because working with the government is very hard. And there's a lot of bureaucracy involved in that. But we are trying to explore ideas and create knowledge in the area where service design can be applied to issues such as corruption. And so I'll give you an example. So. It's, is the government very open to working with service design, though, or are they a bit hesitant? I, I think uh, for us in Nigeria, there is a problem whereby the government is listening more to international agencies than to local agencies. Uh, I think uh, it's more of where you are coming from. If you are coming from a World Bank, you are giving more attention than than some Charles coming from Lagos, you know. So they, are, they pay attention more. But um, the way we're approaching it is not just to, to go and jump into working with the government. It takes a lot of time. As, as an entrepreneur, you started a company on service design. It drains the resources out of you. So it's about letting them come to us, whereby we, form, we start to demonstrate case studies about what service design is doing and what it can do. Um, we, we are bringing out publishing um, newsletters, um, case studies and trying to form this organization and make noise in our own industry for them to come to us. And uh, since we already have agencies working with the government at this point, I think at some point they will open up to trying some of those methodologies as well. Yeah, you also said um, that organizational change is something which uh, you're moving towards in service design. Uh, I also believe that that's a really big part. Like we are also a service design agency in um, in Belgium, and we see uh, like in our project that it naturally evolves in some change in the organization. Like almost every project does. Um, but I'm actually curious how uh, culture in Nigeria is in in companies. Is it very hierarchical, or is it um, more like a flat organization, or how is the the uh, overall like structure of a company? Uh, how is it built in most uh, of them? Yes, I um I would I would put it like this: in most very big multinational companies, it's usually hierarchical, and that is where the problem is in trying to bring in service design to integrate it inside the organizational culture. Then we have the startups, which have been the government and international organizations are paying much more attention to. Because if you listen to the news around the world, you find out that we have a very young workforce and entrepreneurs who are really making waves in terms of ICT in Nigeria. So those companies are flat and they are open and they are the ones that are driving other design disciplines such as interaction design, user experience design, and which is really, really big. And we are working in intersection with them. So the organizational culture, it depends on whether it is a startup company or a very big company. So um, for an organization we have worked with in terms of um, embedding um, service design or design thinking as part of the culture, usually in the areas of something like team building and co-creation activities and trying to um, interpret um, um, disciplines or fields such as customer experience, customer satisfaction and branding as something that design can build on. I think they can relate more to these issues than we are trying to tell them about service design and customer journey mapping. So when we are um, having conversations with them on these fields, we now start to bring in design tools such as customer journey mapping, blueprinting, and they begin to see how these things work on a larger scale. So they try to build teams, they try to build a capacity for design inside the organizations following these routes. 
But um, um, really, like uh, the, hi- the hierarchical system of organizations is really a big problem in how you we try to build culture around here. So um, that is basically how we are set up here in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, do you think uh, are there opportunities for service designers uh, from other parts of the world to be active in Nigeria? Mm, yes, there is massive opportunity. Um, the service design Lagos, we are trying to work with other um, with other organizations, public organizations, private organizations across Africa to be able to build capacity within the continent, especially um, so- South Africa, where we are working with Cape Town Design Center. Um, the, 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 the opportunity is very big for agencies. I think in the past, some agencies tried to move into Nigeria um, about five, six, seven years ago, but at that time it wasn't so ripe. But now we have Nigerians that have design education trained abroad and they are returning back to Nigeria to be able to practice. So because the point is, if you are practicing service design, you have to make sure that you have to see the talent you have to hire. At that point, um, popular service designer um, organizations such as Live Work and Engine that try to come to Africa before I think they left because uh, when you try to hire a talent from abroad, maybe nobody wants to come to Nigeria to work, or maybe you don't see the, the people that are trained in service design. But now we have lots of them practicing service design, practicing user experience design. So uh, there is really great opportunity. I think the market is growing and it will only get better with time. I think five, ten years from now, we will be speaking out. We're having lots of activities and service design happening here in Nigeria. Okay. I think that's a great point uh, to end with uh, for our listeners from around the world listening on the Service Design Day. Um, is there, if people want to find out more about you, uh, you were saying you have uh, written a lot, for instance, about uh, corruption and service design. Where can people find this uh, online? Okay. Um, if you want to find out about my writing, my website is www.policylabafrica policylabafrica.org and um, personally I am creating my writings on Medium and um, a private blog and so um, if anybody wants to find out more you can tweet at me at Charlie Ikim and um, there you can see my private Medium page where I publish some thought pieces That's great, we'll uh, we'll definitely add these links to, uh, to the show notes Uh, is there anything you'd like to uh, share with our listeners still? Um, yes, I think that um, service design is um, a very good approach to be able to build um, a good customer experience and to let um, uh, your customers or your users to experience your service, uh, meaningful services. So I think that it's high time organizations here in Nigeria or anywhere in Africa or around the world to be able to Give the capacity for service design and see what it can do for them. So that is what I have to end with here. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Charles. It was great uh, speaking to you. And uh, uh, are we going to be seeing you at the service design conference uh, in Madrid? Any chance? In Madrid, yes. There is a chance that I will be there. Hopefully, I will be there. I'll be able to meet you guys. Okay. Great. <laughs> That would be great. Well, good luck with uh, everything you're doing and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Matt and Sina. I appreciate your time as well. Stina, you won't believe this. What? There are still some people listening. Hey, that's great. Perhaps we can promote some things. We would like to keep the podcast free after all. That's right. If you want to support the show, the easiest way would be to subscribe, rate and review. You can visit us on servicedesignpodcast.com for more information. Or you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook and join in on the conversation. You can also meet up with us at the Service Design Global Conference, which will be held in Madrid on the 2nd and 3rd of November this year. We'd love to make new connections and meet guests and listeners of the podcast. You can find more information and buy our tickets on the Service Design Network website. And remind us again about Kingdom, Stina. Well, Kingdom is our workshop facilitation card game that provides endless exercises in a small package. You can buy Kingdom on kingdomcards.be. And especially for you, we have arranged a 10 euro discount. Enter the code podcast when you purchase it and you'll get a 10 euro discount. 
Kingdom ships worldwide. Thanks again for listening and until next time. Bye. The Service Design Podcast was brought to you by the Service Design Network and Night Moves. For more information, previous episodes or to join the conversation, please visit servicedesignpodcast.com. For more information about the Service Design Network, visit service-design-network.org and for Night Moves, visit nightmoves.be. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to this podcast. The intro and outro music is from If the Stars Grow Dim Tonight by Hydrogen C featuring I Will I Swear. Until next time.